Thank you, Ms. Reddy. Uh, some of the messages that you've left us with are stark and extremely important. We understand that companies which will succeed in the future will be those that offer seamlessly built product offerings around the customer. They will have to innovate, they will have to build trust. And you've been a leading example for 32 years in which you've managed to build world-class competence and delivery in India at a significant price advantage. We also learned from you that for healthcare to be effective to cover the gaps that are prevalent in the Indian healthcare system, it'll have to be personalized, it'll have to be pervasive, and it'll have to be price sensitive. Those are extremely important messages. I would now request Dr. Wilfried Olba to come and honor Ms. Sangeeta Reddy. We now move to the most exciting part of the evening, which is an interaction with Professor Michael Porter, a man who needs no introduction but needs a welcome, a person whose name is synonymous with strategy. I would now request Amit to welcome Professor Michael Porter. Uh, it is absolutely a proud privilege for me to really welcome Mike for this uh, amazing session that we shared with this. Uh, the person actually needs no introduction, as uh, uh, Madam Reddy had actually said. He's one of the most amazing people in the area of strategy. He's the father, the person who's actually created this modern field. And the idea about economic development, social progress, the idea of shared value can all be attributed to him. But thanks, Mike, for actually being associated with this whole huge initiative. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And maybe we'll actually present Mike Porter live on video from Boston here today. Mike, over to you, please. Well, thank you. Amit, it's nice to see you, even from a long distance. And uh, I am so pleased and so honored about this event about the prize, about everything that's happening uh, uh, because of this uh, prize. And uh, it's just a joy for me to listen and see and participate in this. I wish I were there with you, uh, and I hope next year I will be. Uh, that would be my greatest, uh, greatest dream. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is the middle of the teaching season here at Harvard, and uh, uh, so I couldn't be there today. But I hope that uh, this session uh, the whole thing will be of extremely great interest to you and that this uh, session that we will have right now will also be uh, of great interest. Uh, I want to thank all the companies and the sponsors and the team that made this all possible. I won't name you all, but uh, I, be, be sure that I know who you are and I'm very, very appreciative. And Amit, a special thanks to you uh, from uh, bottom of my heart for everything you've done to bring some of these ideas and this thinking and this work uh, to India and to make it more widely diffused within the Indian uh, business community and, and also hopefully in other fields like healthcare that we just discussed where uh, I've also worked and I think uh, there's an opportunity for transformation that uh, I've heard about. So uh, what I'd like to do very briefly today is talk about my newest work in strategy. Uh, and competition, and that's work around the changing nature of products, um, what we call smart connected products. Uh, now, some of you, uh, all of you, I'm sure, have heard the phrase Internet of Things. Uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion of the Internet of Things, but, but ultimately, uh, we found that Internet of Things doesn't really capture what this is really all about. It, the internet is well established. We know what the internet is. That's a pipe that moves data around. But what's really changing here is the things. It's what a product is. It's what a product can do. Uh, and it's pretty much everything about a manufacturing company uh, and, and the way a manufacturing company operates. And uh, this is, uh, from a technology point of view, one of the most profound uh, dynamics and change drivers that uh, I've ever seen in my years of working in this field. And I think it's going to prove to be even bigger than the previous generations of IT uh, that have actually had a profound impact on competition. Um, this, th this work is described in two articles uh, so far uh, in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, one was published last November. Um, which really focused on the outside implications, the implications on competition and competitive advantage and, and, and industry of, uh, definition and really how companies competed. Uh, just at this moment, this week, 
there's a second article uh, in the Harvard Business Review which is focused on the internal and organizational implications of the changing nature of products. Um, and the impact that we're seeing here is, is really quite cross-cutting. It, it's impacting manufacturing industries. Virtually every manufactured good now there is seeing a change in the nature of competition. It's actually impacting service industries because with these new kinds of products, service companies can operate differently. And it's also imp impacting the IT field. Uh, and of course, India has been a major player in IT a major participant in the previous generations of IT-driven transformation. Uh, and the real question is, you know, is India equipped? And are Indian companies equipped uh, to uh, play in this next game? And uh, I think the answer is they can, they could. But this is a big leap. Um, and this is going to involve a lot of, a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of new skills, a lot of new uh, ways of looking at things. And, and what I'd like to do uh, this uh, evening is very briefly talk about some of the key ideas. But, but we're not going to do justice to this topic. And I would encourage all of you, wherever you are in the economy, what kind of good you produce, uh, to actually uh, really dig into this field. And, uh, uh, and hopefully, this will be a starting point in that process. Now, the, the basic uh, uh, kind of history here is that uh, it, it, if we go back far enough, uh, products were mechanical uh, and electrical, and information processing within a company was manual. We had files, we wrote things down, um, and uh, that's the way that competition was across the economy uh, uh, for many, 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 many years. Um, but starting in the late 1960s, uh, the advent of modern information technology allowed us to start changing what firms do and how they do it. Um, it uh, the first phase was to allow the automation of the activities within the value chain. Uh, the collection of information, the processing of information for product design, for order processing, all across the value chain, that started transforming and dramatically becoming more productive. Um, over time, as the internet uh, uh, emerged, uh, there was another generation in which the value chain and the activities could be integrated and coordinated. Uh, coordination across the whole value chain, coordination across geography, uh, coordination with business partners, uh, uh, coordination with customers. Uh, and that was the year of uh, you know, supply chain management and customer relationship management and product lifecycle management. Um, which we would, we would say was the, really the second wave. But now, um, we are now starting to feel and touch the third wave of IT-driven uh, competition uh, and transformation, and that's the embedding of the IT actually in the product itself. Uh, not just in the processes within the firm, but the product itself. Now, uh, what does that mean? Well, um, we now have what we call uh, smart connected products. Uh, the product has a physical component uh, that it's always had, and it will always have, electrical component, a mechanical component. But now we are embedding smartness in that product in the form of sensors that are measuring a lot of things about that product. Um, electronic and control uh, uh, characteristic uh, uh, attributes that are allowing us to actually electronically rather than mechanically control what products do. Um, embedding software in the product that actually the brains and, and is running a lot of this, uh, the control activity and the other functionality of the product. Um, and, uh, and, and a new kind of user, user interface on the product itself, instead of dials and on-off switches, we have screens and we have much more flexible onboard uh, user interfaces on products. So that's kind of what we call the smart part of the product. But then there's the connected part of the product. And that's the connectivity between the product uh, uh, and the internet. Uh, via some form of uh, wireless or Bluetooth or uh, any uh, multiple forms of connectivity. Uh, and then that product is tethered to what we call a product cloud. And the product cloud is, is running independently of the product on a server in a data center. And the product cloud is actually operating a lot of stuff, which we'll talk about a little bit later, 
that actually allows the product to work and, and, and provides a lot of the functionality that used to be only in the product, but now there's a lot of functionality and a lot of ability to uh, uh, control the product that now is separated from the product on this product cloud. This is a smart connected product. And uh, a smart connected product uh, is starting to transform what products can do um, and how they create value for the customer. And that, of course, then is, in fact, in competition and who we compete with and the nature of that competition and what competitive advantages we can build and what competitive advantages no longer matter. Uh, uh, now, uh, the basic functionality of smart connected products uh, can be really broken into four different categories, each of which builds on the other. At the base layer, these products now, can, as they are generating uh, uh, lots of data, uh, all kinds of data about what, how the product is operating, the condition of the product, whether it's hot or cold, uh, the environment surrounding the product, the product can now sense what's going on around it. Um, the, we have all this ability to monitor how the product is doing. The product is now kind of sensing its own operation and telling us about it. Um, now, with the monitoring, we can also layer on control, and that control is both on the product but also remote from the product. So we can control a product remotely now. We can tell it or ask it to do things without operating it you know, in, right there. Um, and uh, the control uh, allows us to control the configuration of the product, what set of characteristics it's, it, it, it's embodying right now. Uh, the control allows us to control the operation of the product. Uh, uh, you know, how we, we can operate that product in much more sophisticated ways than we ever, ever could before uh, because of the embedded software, because of the embedded electronics, because of the uh, ability to do this remotely. Uh, we've changed the way uh, we can control products and we're getting a lot of new functionality as a result. Uh, now, if we have monitoring, the information, control, the ability to control lots of things about how the product works, then we add a third layer, which is optimization. If we have algorithms, uh, we can actually start optimizing things about how the product works, how the product operates, uh, how we do service. Uh, we, can we can sense whether the product is failing. Uh, we can sense whether it needs to be repaired. Uh, we can actually sometimes repair it uh, remotely because uh, we have this remote control function uh, that I talked about earlier. Now, and then it, on, uh, on monitoring control and optimization, we can now finally build what many people have been dreaming about for many, many years, which is autonomy. Products can kind of run themselves. Uh, they, they, they know what's going on around them. They can get information from other products and from other sources. They can, uh, they can, they can learn. They can fix themselves in, in, in some cases. They can repair themselves. Uh, because of these fundamental capabilities that have been really now embedded in products for the first time ever. Uh, this is exploding functionality opportunities. It's confusing. There's so many things now you can do with a product that one of the hardest things, as we'll see later, is choosing what functionality do you want to include in your product and how to build that out over time, how to charge for it, and so on. But we're getting a little bit ahead of the story. Now, in order to operate a product now, you don't just have the product, <laughs> uh, but you have what we, there's a whole technology stack now. This is something that manufacturing companies never had to do before. Uh, this was, none of this was really necessary. Uh, but now a manufacturing company has to not only make a product, but has to operate this infrastructure, this technology infrastructure forever so that that product can be uh, uh, operable. Now, that, that sounds like a pain, but it actually is an opportunity. Because this infrastructure allows us to actually keep improving that product even after we've shipped it. Uh, and keep improving it over, over time and keep uh, modifying its functionality and, and working with the customer to create more value. So the technology stack is at one level a barrier to entry. This is a new thing we've got to do, but it's also a, 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 a tremendous enabler to kind of changing value and, and changing the nature of competition. Uh, the, the technology and the product we've already talked about, uh, then there's some kind of network communications connection uh, that the product has to establish with uh, the internet. Uh, and, but the real core of the new uh, technology necessary 
uh, in a manufacturing company is this notion of a product cloud. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a set of uh, software running on a, a server, either in the company or a rented server. Uh, uh, and, and this product cloud really, first of all, has a database where the product is talking to this database and, and, and inserting data in the database of all types. Um, and uh, that's a bit of a different kind of database than that we're, we're typically used to uh, thinking about in, in IT. Uh, there's a platform on which you, applications can run that actually do things. Uh, there's some rules and analytic engines and algorithms populated on the product cloud that are actually governing, uh, you know, kind of what if circumstances, if this happens, do this. Uh, and then there's all these many, many applications, service applications, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, control applications, various kinds of applications running on this cloud uh, and, and giving instructions, if you will, to the product to, to do things. Uh, but it's not just that technology stack that's operating. There's also sort of this surrounding, surrounding structure. Uh, some of that is, first of all, a tremendously complex security and identity problem. All of a sudden, instead of, you know, the, the, instead of having a physical product somewhere, you've got a product that you can access in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, you can actually uh, access the product if you can access the cloud that has contact with the product. So, so the security issues and the identity issues uh, that have to surround the product now are much more complex. Um, in forms of information, uh, the product is generating information now, that's new, but we can also find external information, the weather, uh, the commodity prices, uh, all kinds of relevant in information that we don't have to measure on the product. The product doesn't have to measure the temperature around it. Uh, you know, there's lots of database and data feeds on what the temperature is in Boston today. Um, uh, we can get all kinds of external data and then merge it into the data that the product is generating and put those things together. Uh, and that's allowing, again, some of this optimization I was talking about. Also, there are traditional business systems, your CRM system, your ERP system, and all that data uh, that's relevant can be connected also to the product data. So if you're, for example, what's the warranty uh, that the customer has? And how do you connect that warranty with how you optimize the product op operation? And what do you monitor to do that? Well, that's all, that's all specific to the particular warranty structure. So, but we can put that information together. Um, and uh, as, as I, you, it's already clear, the data part of this, what information we now had that we never had before, that we can connect in ways that we never could before, this is at the core of this phenomenon. And this is something that manufacturing companies, uh, this is a big leap for manufacturing companies to learn and think about how to deal uh, with this information. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now this of course has profound impacts on competition uh, at the industry level. Uh, and there's, there's some really good things about this. One, it, it, it creates more opportunities for product differentiation. It can shift rivalry uh, away from price. It can actually make it hard to get in business and protect you from new competitors. Uh, all these things are potential positives for competition, they, they, and they can potentially improve profitability uh, in, in businesses. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's some uh, challenges that are potentially created, uh, like the higher fixed cost. Uh, this, this kind of product has higher fixed cost than the previous mechanical uh, so, uh, the, uh, so there's some positive aspects of the change in competition and industry structure, but there's also some challenging aspects, like higher fixed costs, like the fact that the customer now has much more visibility on the product, you know, how the product is being used, how many hours a day it's being used, how many times it broke down. All this stuff is now very, very visible. Uh, and we have an op what we're seeing now is new companies that understand this new world are getting into industries that they could never get in before because the traditional barriers to entry were too high. So, so this is a, uh, a, uh, a, a game-changing potential uh, discontinuity in the nature of industry competition and the, the which is how a manufacturing company can, first of all, understand this, but also make sure that the story turns out well. Uh, and doesn't turn out to threaten their uh, additional position. 
Uh, one of the other major dynamics of smart connected products is, in general, an expansion of industry boundaries. Uh, you know, traditionally, uh, say if you're a tractor company, uh, you saw yourself in the tractor business. Uh, and you competed to make your tractor more and more, you know, high value. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, technology isn't perfect yet, even though it's much better. Um, so what I was saying is the boundaries of competition are broadening. And this, this picture really shows you, you know, you used to be a farm tractor company. But now you can connect that tractor with a planter and a harvester and a tiller. And even more broadly, you can connect it to sort of a farm management system with uh, the irrigation and the seed and the fertilizing and the weather uh, patterns and the forecasts. And all of that means that you don't compete just in the tractor business anymore. You potentially compete in a much broader industry with other people who make other kinds of products that are part of that system. And that dynamic is, uh, uh, again, having major impacts on, on industry competition. Um, uh, broadening uh, who you compete with, uh, broadening the nature of that rivalry and creating uh, new potential interests. Uh, people that used to be making totally other products may now have a, a path into, into getting into your business uh, as part of that building management system or that farm management system. Uh, so the nature of competition is changing and strategy choices have uh, been modified. Uh, and this slide really talks about what's the unique strategy choices that you now have to make that you didn't have to make before. And you know, the first one, of course, is what of all this capability do you want to actually embed in your product? Because you can't do it all. It's just too much, too costly. Uh, how much do you want to put in the product versus running it from the cloud? Big technical issue, big uh, issue in terms of uh, uh, competitive dynamics. Uh, you know, what data to capture? How much? How? Uh, you know, how to how to figure out who owns this data? Is it the customer? It is. Uh, you know, what business model? Uh, this these new products allow us to move to products as a service because we can uh, monitor the usage of the product and take control over the service of the product, uh, and so on. So uh, I, think, I think what we all understand now is that the strategy game is evolving. And the same principles apply, but the options uh, are, and choices are so, uh, in this world. Now, uh, what the new article that just came out uh, this week has really focused on is, OK, that's about the outside implications of co for competition. What about the inside of the company? How does, how does the company change? How does a manufacturing company look different uh, if it's in this world of smart connected products? And uh, of course, what's very, very interesting here is that the product difference, product difference is translating into a lot of differences inside the company in how the company performs the traditional functions of manufacturing. And it's, it's actually quite a... Internal uh, again. I, I apologize for this uh, tech, tech, tech concern. So let's take a few of the functions of manufacturing uh, of a manufacturing company, uh, uh, and let's look at them. Uh, now, the first place to start, of course, is the data, and we have all this new data coming in. Uh, it has to be stored in different ways than traditional data has been stored in companies. It's unstructured data. It, it can't be structured. There, there are new kinds of databases to store it in, uh, new, new kinds of analytics to look at this data and understand what it tells us. And some of the data is telling us obvious things, but other data, uh, we don't quite know how to make sense of it. And we can find things in the data that are not obvious. And that's what is typically called big data analytics. And that's a whole new way of analyzing data that most companies have never done before. It takes a new kind of people. We're, we're now starting to see companies form unified data organizations. Rather than having each function hold the data for its function, we're now integrating that data because the data really has profound impacts across functions. 
And we're seeing a new C-level job called the chief information officer uh, to actually manage this in manufacturing companies today. Um, product design with these new capabilities is, of course, uh, changing dramatically. Uh, I think one of the most profound changes is from now on, it, it, first of all, it's systems engineering. It's not mechanical engineering or software engineering or any other one kind of engineering. It's systems engineering now. It's pulling these things together. Uh, it's evergreen design. It's, it's not a, bi a, a design, a new model and then, that you, you release and then, and then the next new model comes out three, four, five years from now. This is different. We're seeing evergreen, continual customization, uh, continual improvement of the design, uh, where that design can be continuously evolved and the product can be continuously updated and upgraded through the connectivity, through the software. Uh, new kinds of inter interfaces, uh, new kinds of service, which we'll talk about later, that are enabled, but you have to design for that remote service when you actually design the product. Uh, uh, design to support new business models, uh, uh, and, you, and you see the others. So <clears throat> the nature of product development is, is being <coughs> completely uh, transformed within most manufacturing companies. The mix of personnel involved, who's there, how they go about it is being changed. Uh, manufacturing uh, has been, the, manu the physical manufacturing part is being uh, changed as well uh, in a variety of ways that uh, you, can, you can see on the screen. Uh, the physical complexity of products is, is, tends to be going down a little bit because a lot of the variability of the product uh, can be generated through the software, not through hardware. Um, and uh, a lot of the uh, finalization uh, of the product can be happening very, very late, even in the field. So a lot of the things that traditional manufacturing has had to do now can be done in different ways. But what's really interesting is making the physical product is not making the product. <laughs> you got to make the physical product, but you got to make the, you got to run the infrastructure to run the product forever. Uh, so, and that has to be seamless and continuously available because without this cloud, the product is not going to be able to function or function in the same way that uh, wanted it to. So, so in a sense, the no whole notion of manufacturing uh, sort of has broadened in some interesting ways. Uh, marketing. Uh, mar Traditionally, in the physical product world, and in uh, traditional, you make the product, uh, you sell the product, and then you're done. And then you know you chat with a customer every once in a while, and then you then then you try to get a good excuse to sell another product, uh, the next the next model. Uh, uh, in this world, uh, you have an ongoing relationship with that customer. Uh, because you know what's happening to that product, you know how often that product is used, you know whether it's functioning well or poorly. The, uh, the customer knows how well things are going as well. Uh, and they have more visibility. And so what we're seeing is a different kind of customer relationship. It's, it's, a on, it's an ongoing relationship where you have to take responsibility for making sure that the customer is getting value out of the product and working with them to make sure that they're taking advantage of the product and what it can do. And they know about the functionality and they know about uh, the opportunities that uh, the product offers. And uh, this is a, a kind of a new marketing rhythm. Uh, and it takes a, a kind of different kind of capability. Should I continue or? OK. Um, the uh, service function is being radically reconfigured. Uh, instead of having to have service respond to a breakdown, so again, we're having difficulty, but we're going to power through and uh, we're going to get the same benefit, uh, even though we can't. Uh, it isn't perfect. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, so as I was talking, the service function is changing because we can now be proactive about service. We can see when we need for service. We need service. We can see what service we need. Uh, we can see breakdowns before they're, they're going to happen in the pattern of data that the product is giving off. And, and so service is, we're re-engineering service. Uh, and also the data is allowing us to do new kinds of service uh, and provide new services uh, to our customers that uh, that we've never been able to operate before. And there's lots of other interesting dimensions that this new article in HBR uh, talks about. Uh, 
In terms of uh, data rights, security, and privacy, this now becomes a first order issue in the manufacturing company. Uh, before, we've been protecting our data center from intrusion, and that was important, and that's really hard. But now we've got a much harder security and privacy issue because there's a lot more data, and we've got this product, and we've got the cloud, and the products are all out there. And if we can penetrate the software in the product, we can get into the cloud. And so uh, there's a whole new uh, rhythm of security, uh, uh, IT security, that is emerging. Uh, and there's an incredible need now to protect people's data because it's even more vulnerable, and to protect the company's data and the company's, uh, you know, inside data, uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing machines or or other uh, smart connected products actually operating within uh, within the company. So there's a whole new field here developing. It's early early days. Uh, the article covers some of the key points. Um, so let me, let me conclude by talking about some of the organizational changes. Uh, you know, we, traditionally the business unit in a manufacturing firm uh, has looked pretty much the same for a long, long, long time. Uh, it's been in a functional structure, and you all recognize this. this we, we see these organization structures all the time, and the picture looks a little different, but the functions are the same. Functions are sort of relatively autonomous. There's handoffs and coordination among them, but that is relatively uh, episodic, and uh, there are various coordinating mechanisms that we use to get that coordination done, uh, that coordination done when, when it needs to get done. But with a smart connected product, and given the nature of the activities I was talking about earlier, this traditional organizational model breaks down in a smart connected products world, uh, given the nature of the data, the nature of the new kind of coordination and integration necessary, which is much deeper and literally continuous all the time. The sales and service people need to know what's happening to the product, and the R&D people need to be continuously product and and, and so we, we've got to change the organizational model. And most companies don't yet understand this. This is very nascent, but as we study this and, 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 and reach out and, and get and, and understand uh, the leaders in the field of smart connected products, we're seeing the organizational issue get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, uh, there's a number of organizational changes that will, we believe, although this is still nascent. One, I've already discussed a unified data organization. We got to we got to get that data in one place because it's too complicated to store it. It's too complicated to analyze it. Uh, we can't have everybody poking around at that. The skills are very in short supply. The expertise is in very short supply. We've got to have a unified data. Uh, so the unified data organization is the first major uh, organizational change that we're seeing. The second is uh, the um, my slide is not changing on the screen here. Here we go. The second change is the need to sort of blur the boundary between IT and R&D, which traditionally been, those two have been separate groups. The IT works on the data systems. The R&D does the product development. Now those things are merging. Number three, we're seeing the need for a new team or sub-function, and maybe over time a whole function, which, which is sometimes called DevOps, which is to actually, the group that actually makes sure that that infrastructure keeps running but gets improved and updated uh, and enhanced over time in a seamless way. Because we can't, when we're fixing our product cloud and our operating system, we can't stop the products in the field. You know? So we got to do this in a seamless, real way. Uh, and there's a, th that takes a, a coordinated effort, which uh, we, we find in many companies that there, you need a new group to really manage that process. They're, they're interacting with R&D, they're interacting with manufacturing and, oper and the infrastructure, they're manufacturing with service, but, but they're kind of coordinating that new function. And then we, we also are finding the need for a new kind of customer-facing organization. Uh, we call it here customer success management, in which uh, there's a group of people that's literally monitoring the success of the customer all the time and making sure if the customer's using the product, getting maximum value, getting good uptime, taking advantage of the features and the functionality that are, that are possible. Uh, and, and, and so the manufacturing firm is going to look different uh, than it has for the last 50 or 75 years. Uh, it's going to start to embody some new needs because of this fundamental change in the nature of products, what those products can do, and how that changes the nature of work actually inside the firm. Uh, now, uh, this is a big transition. Uh, 
it's just beginning. Uh, we see very few fully filled out new organizational models uh, for managing the, the, uh, the smart connected products firm. Uh, the irony is that companies are going to have to run the dumb products and the smart connected products, they're going to have to manage both of them <laughs> for a long time because uh, Caterpillar Tractor, for example, is not going to be able to take all their tractors that are not smart connected off the market overnight. They're going to be running for decades. And so we, we have the complexity of really having to run the old and the new together. So that makes organizational change even more complicated here. Uh, what we're seeing is some transitional structures. Uh, and you see these on the screen. I won't go through them in detail. They're, again, covered in, the, in this new article uh, that really are bridges between where we are today and where we'll ultimately be in the long run when the smart connected products are, you know, the full product line. Um, and they help, uh, they help build capability, help scarce resources get shared. Uh, and uh, we, the leading companies in this space are using these kind of transitional structures, like a center of excellence, to actually drive this technology and this way of thinking across all the business units in, 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 many, in many cases. Um, uh, just to conclude, I, I will, will say that there is uh, something really large going on here. Um, you know, IT uh, inside the firm, the traditional, you know, wave one and wave two really transform productivity within a company. The productivity growth in the economy world was heavily uh, affected and, and, and increased by IT, the previous generations of IT. This next stage of IT is uh, going to change productivity again in a really profound way, not just inside the company, but also in productivity and in, in the use of the products, these new products that can be used much more efficiently and with more uptime and better capacity utilization and higher levels of impact and functionality. Um, there's going to be a whole new generation of lean here. There's a lot of waste still, a lot of things that are not used, a lot of things that are used poorly, a lot of downtime, uh, a lot of uh, unnecessary stuff because we haven't had the visibility uh, and the data to really uh, root out that waste. Uh, that's going to happen now. Uh, as smart connected products become available, service industries uh, are changing. Uh, Running an airline with a smart connected plane, which now doesn't exist, believe it or not. There, you, you might have a Wi-Fi on the plane, but that's for the entertainment of the passenger. There's not a continuous smart connected uh, connection between that plane and the ground all the time that can, that can take advantage of all the benefits that can be created in terms of both the flight operations, the maintenance, the baggage operations. So, so not only are manufacturing industries being affected here, but so if you're a leader in the service industry or you're a company in the service industry, you've got to think about it. Well, how can I use these products to change what I do for the better? Uh, we also, uh, of course, are going to see uh, the ability to meet human needs better. Uh, less use of water, less wasted resources, less uh, the reuse of products. We can upgrade products. We don't have to throw them away. We can upgrade and continuously improve them and, 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 and rework them and, uh, w without needing to replace. Uh, so we'll see, few, we'll, we'll see fewer whole models and more upgrades that are happening continuously and remotely uh, with the product. Uh, now, of course, any wave of innovation like this is always scary, uh, particularly recently where people, we're worried about jobs and we're worried about what is this going to do to jobs and the nature of work and who's going to be able to participate in this new uh, generation. And, and here I think the news is actually uh, good. Uh, the initial demand is for very highly skilled people with very unique skills. But what we see is that this technology is going to get a lot of other jobs. And it's going to make it easier for people without a lot of skill to do their existing jobs. So one uh, interesting uh, thing you may have heard of is augmented reality, uh, where if you've got a product and you can, ha you can connect the information about that product uh, to, uh, say, a, say, a uh, iPad. Uh, a technician can put an iPad uh, towards a product and see a lot of data about that product. And a technician can actually get instructions for how to repair that product. Uh, with an iPad application in a smart connected product world. So uh, that's an example of how somebody with that same 
training uh, can actually become quite productive in performing uh, new and important roles in the economy. So we are optimistic that uh, this is not just going to threaten uh, less skilled workers, but it's also going to generate a lot of net growth in the economy which, and also allow workers to gather skills and be trained in different ways. Right now our whole training process is very cumbersome, very costly, and and not that effective in many countries, but, but we now have different ways to train people uh, that, and, and enable them to do their work uh, with the support from the data and analytics and other uh, uh, user interfaces that we are now creating. Uh, this is very early in the, in the process. There's a lot of buzz about IoT, but in terms of the reality of it, uh, you know, smart connected products are just emerging. Uh, companies only have limited parts of their product lines are starting to enable uh, to, to embody this technology. We have a long way to go here. There's plenty of time, but it is big, uh, and it is a big it is a big change. And uh, I think everybody in this room uh, uh, running these terrific companies that you represent in India, uh, we're going to have to confront this and figure out what to do. Um, I think India uh, has to confront this. Uh, India is a major player in manufacturing, a major player in service industries, a major player in IT. And what this is doing is, is kind of upending a lot of the playbook that we've seen for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and that's both an opportunity, uh, but it's also a challenge. And, and I note that the country has a sort of a national IoT plan. Uh, there's some sensible things you're talking about doing, but uh, uh, I think this is something that is going to take uh, really concentrated attention for all you CEOs in the room, but also uh, government leaders and education leaders who are going to make need to make sure that the country is equipped uh, to play. So uh, that's a brief uh, overview. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions anybody has in the time we have. I'm sorry we've had the complication, but hopefully the message has gotten through. Uh, and uh, we, I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with a session like that, I think we need to have somebody represent India Inc. and it has to be a leader of stature who will engage on behalf of India Inc. with Professor Michael Porter. Uh, we are very proud to have today with us Mr. Sajan Jindal, the chairman of JSW Group. He has led the creation of the largest private steel manufacturer in India, a firm that embodies the best of technology, sustainability, strategy, and most importantly, Indian ambition. I hand over to Mr. Sajan Jindal to engage with Mr. Mort, Mr. Port. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very enlightening and uh, it's really uh, fantastic. This is the first time that I'm getting this opportunity to hear you. So it's really, uh, I must thank you for, uh, for this talk. Um, I had few questions and after that maybe there could be other people who would have uh, questions. Um, um, one of my first question is that, uh, you know, India, uh, I mean, as you said that the technology will, will uh, take uh, the company's manufacturing sector to a different level with, where we'll have connectivity with different uh, sorts of uh, things which will, uh, the product manufacturer will not only manufacture that product but uh, other associated uh, IT services would be associated with it which will give a different product to the, to the customer. Uh, given the manufacturing sector in India, which we missed, uh, India was an agricultural society, and then we leapfrogged and we uh, switched over from agricultural state to the uh, services. And today, uh, our manufacturing sector remained uh, quite uh, dismal at 15% of our GDP. So what would it uh, uh, take to take Indian manufacturing sector to uh, our stated goal of 25%? Well, it's, it's a great question, and, and you're right, India is, is underweighted in manufacturing uh, relative to uh, many of the other leading economies in the world. Uh, and, and, uh, the, but the good news is you're overweighted in services and, and overweighted in IT uh, expertise. Uh, and, uh, you know, what's happening here is actually we're putting sort of an IT software company and a manufacturing company together. <laughs> mm. Uh, so in, in a way, if we think about it that way, uh, uh, we have the capa capacity to do that better uh, and faster in India than where we have very well-developed traditional manufacturing companies that are kind of 
comfortable in succeeding in the old game. So uh, I, I think um, uh, hopefully the IT uh, expertise of the country will give rise to a lot of entrepreneurs that will uh, kind of be the pioneers of some of the new manufacturing companies in India that take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, and hopefully the manufacturing leaders sitting in this room and, and elsewhere in the country will see that here is our, here is our leapfrog opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I think India brings some, ex so comparing India to China, you know, I think, I think India brings some ad advantages here given the deep uh, uh, IT expertise, the international experience that many Indians have in, in, in software and, and process and, and IT dimensions that uh, we don't see uh, companies in, in other countries having. Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think if, if everybody's kind of dedicated to move on this, uh, I think here's your chance to kind of quickly catch up, uh, and uh, uh, I think. It, it, but in order to do that, I think you need to first of all, you need to make sure that your I I Indian institutes are not training for the past IT jobs; they're training for the future IT jobs um, uh, at the highest level. Uh, I think number two, I think you're going to have to really try to master the security and IP and regulatory issues here of how to protect data and how to establish data rights and how to create a regulatory environment that, that really fosters this in a set of innovation rather than And uh, I, I think I think the, though I, th I think we can we can tell a very positive story here, yeah. and I, I don't think we should view this as a threat. Uh, we should view it, I think, mostly in India as an opportunity. Uh, my second question, uh, uh, Professor Porter, is that uh, given the large uh, new incumbents coming in for job every year in our country, uh, close to 15 million uh, educated well-trained uh, youth which is coming into uh, job market every year. Uh, will this uh, IT and IT-enabled services, will this uh, hinder their uh, opportunity to get jobs? Will it uh, uh, create problems for them to, to get jobs? Well, uh, I don't think we know. <laughs> Uh, quite how this is going to play itself out because every time uh, we feel like we've seen uh, a clear pattern, we, we see yet a, another innovation and another innovation and another product area that... Hmm. ...that we couldn't believe was, was going to change is, is changing in ways we didn't anticipate. Um, I, I think one of the things, though, is I've been convinced is that there's so many new things that can be done and so many new needs that can be met here that the net effect will be positive for growth. Uh, we're going to have more growth. We're going to have we're going to have we're going to be able to meet more needs, and some of those are going to be in services. I mean, India needs a lot more health care. <laughs> Uh, and that's going to be, there's going to be a lot more people necessary to do that health care. Uh, and Indi India could improve its housing for lots and lots of people. And, and so there's a lot of needs in India. The problem is not needs. The problem is the ability to meet those needs cost effectively. Uh, and I think this technology is going to be a discontinuity in the ability to meet those needs. And as a result, I think it will have a net positive impact on growth and, and jobs. But I, as I said earlier, I'm also very intrigued by how this uh, technology uh, is, is going to affect how it's going to affect the ability of individuals to do jobs. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think if we can harness the possibilities uh, for using the technology to supplement and enhance people's capability, uh, even people with not a lot of training or deep expertise in a particular field, I, I think that it will, again, it will, it will be a 
good thing and it will give people an opportunity to, 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 to do jobs that are more productive and will command a, a little bit better wage. So um, I, I think, um, again, I'm, I'm, I think inherently a bit of an optimist and I, and, I, and, I, and I know there's a deep concern in the world Uh, about about the effect of technology on work and on jobs, and uh, are we going to have any jobs left? You know, as everything gets automated. But I think this is a little bit different than just automating away the work that other people have done. There's a lot of new work that's necessary here, and a lot of new opportunity I think that we can create. So, you know, it cuts out when I'm talking, Mr. Jindal. I, I don't know if that's there's a reason for that, but. Uh, uh, anyway, but uh, I think I, again, I, I, I believe that that we can we can make this a good story for jobs. Yeah. Uh, India is uh, known for its traditional industries like leather, textile, diamond, and uh, other uh, such industries where uh, a lot of people are uh, in the job. Now this time it's cut when I'm speaking. <laughs> This time it got cut when I'm speaking. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I feel, said a, I feel a little better. <laughs> so uh, uh, now, uh, uh, you know, uh, hearing you uh, with 4.0 coming into the uh, picture with globally uh, companies would be adopting uh, high-tech high uh, industries, pr probably doing the similar things like textile and uh, leather and uh, stuff like that. Uh, that's the big worry that, uh, you know, Listening to you, hearing you, I was I was feeling that uh, would that uh, give a, some sort of a restricted employment opportunities uh, in our country? Yeah. Again, a great question. Um, what we know is that as economies advance, the service component of the economy grows. And uh, many of those services are quite local. Again, I buy, back to the points I made earlier about health care, about housing, about uh, uh, child care, about uh, uh, education, uh, about uh, you know, beautification of the environment, you know, gardening. There's all kinds of, of yeah. ways to improve the quality of life Entertainment. if we can afford to. Uh, and uh, so I think that, that over time, um, uh, hopefully as the uh, economy gets uh, continued more productive, uh, and by the way, that's going to take some regulatory uh, simplification. I, my, my forecast would be that over time we, we will see this tremendous need within India uh, for services uh, really be, and we know services are much more labor intensive than goods. Uh, so I think, I think, uh, we, I think that's, that's our positive trajectory is to think about it that way. So, but that said, I think manufacturing firms like yours are going to have to embrace all of this uh, uh, stuff inside the company, and, and that, may, that may mean that you won't need as many people because you can do the service predictively or you can do it remotely. So we can't, we can't not move in this direction because we're afraid we're not going to create more jobs. We have to, we have to, see, uh, we have to seize the broad opportunity. We, we, can't, we can't try to stop this because it won't stop and uh, I think India has made strides in, in, in opening and embracing and, and, and deregulating and I, I, think, I think those strides need to be uh, continued and, and uh, I think hopefully over time those are going to start to actually come back and benefit uh, citizens, uh, so many citizens in the country that, that need, need better and more uh, of lots of different kinds of things to improve the quality of their life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Porter. If there's anybody else. Uh... Uh, Professor Porter, my name is Himanshu Jain. I work for Sealed Air Corporation, uh, the corporation which invented bubble wrap. You may be familiar with the name. I was amazed that the concept and the presentation you made is exactly the lines on which our corporation is working globally to create something which we call Internet of Clean. It's a registered trademark. The concept is that uh, the devices talk to each other to improve the compliance, reduce the infections, improve the hygiene, and the whole space. And I just couldn't resist the temptation of standing up and saying 
Now it's actually, I can see it in action in my own company. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a, a great story that's very encouraging, and, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of great companies that are learning uh, and innovating and making things better in this technology, and I, and I know there are great Indian examples. And here uh, at Harvard, we would love to learn about all these examples. So if anybody has, uh, has one, you know, write us, you know, reach out to me. Uh, and maybe next year we'll have a Smart Connected Products Prize as part of this, this event. Uh, because I think we need to highlight both who's doing it and how they're doing it in India. Mike, that's a great inspiration for a Smart Connected Prize. In fact, uh, we just wrote a paper on Internet Things, which you have already seen. Uh, and we believe it's actually inspired by you, which we are going to launch sometime soon. Uh, we have Vijay here, who actually heads the Indian National Congress uh, in Karnataka. Uh, so a political party, he wanted to ask you a question on governance. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, it's very nice to talk to you, Mr. Porter. I come from a city called Bangalore. I'm, a, I'm sure you know Bangalore very well. Uh, I'm just seeing you talk on manufacturing sector, but I see IoT. Yeah, I just wanted you to share with us on the government side, uh, IoT, I see it from your presentation. Uh, government also can benefit from IoT. Are there any case studies of IoT being used for smart cities and smart uh, governance? Well, uh, you know, it's an e excellent point, and uh, it has not been our focus in the work to highlight those examples, but they are out there. They exist. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, your, your question is going to stimulate us to do a little more more work there and pull together our thoughts on that. Um, uh, you know, this this chain this allows you to really improve and optimize uh, the nature of water systems, uh, of uh, electrical grids, uh, of highway uh, functioning in a city. Uh, there's no need to uh, uh, you know you can reduce congestion dramatically with this technology. Uh, when, when, you have, when you have the data about the cars and, 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 and so there so is a big opportunity for government functions, it's a big opportunity for public services, uh, and uh, it's a big opportunity for social services. And uh, I think the executives that are leading those activities in government need to see the smart connected products as a major lever to uh, make uh, discontinuous change in how these public functions are being performed. And uh, so uh, uh, it's our job to pull together perhaps some more thoughts on that and, and write about that. But I think you've raised a very important point. And uh, we, we do see examples around the world of, 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 of various cities, various regions, and various countries embracing this. The, the first round of our You know, kind of e-government was really about the inside of the machinery of government. This is now going to be about the government functions uh, of traffic control and safety and uh, and, and water management and and, th and things like that. And and that is now beginning. Uh, uh, and we need to be just as focused on that. Just so, if you didn't hear, just as focused on the public functions and how to make those much more productive than, than uh, as we are on the more traditional commercial side of the house. And uh, so that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. And uh, hopefully there'll be, we'll, we'll produce something on that uh, soon. But we'd love to have a dialogue. Uh, you know, my email is mporter at hbs.edu. Uh, HBS is Harvard Business School. So mporter at hbs.edu. We'd love to hear from any of you with an example. We'd love to hear from you with a question. Uh, this is something that we're going to be learning about for many, many years to come. I think we've got a good set of core ideas here in these two articles that I mentioned, but uh, there's, uh, there's going to be much work to be done, and, and we're anxious to, to hear from any of you, and anxious to make sure that this technology works for India, not against it in some unfortunate way. So uh, uh, we're committed to that, and we'd love to have this dialogue uh, continue. Professor Porter, wonderful questions and as you uh, wonderful concepts and as you can see, I think yeah, India is so hungry for knowledge. We've been extremely patient with this technology here, uh, but 
I think the question I really wanted to ask you is we come from a healthcare environment and while there's a huge shortage of skilled labor in India, there's also a tremendous capability of cost-effective caring. The concept of remote care has been proven a long time ago but hasn't scaled appropriately. What do you see in the future of the ability of a young India to care for an aging world in an environment where there is such a shortage, a global shortage of healthcare capability, there is a large interim step before machine intelligence takes over. How do you see this panning out? And what do you see in terms of the regulative environment constraining some of this growth? Work very, very heavily in healthcare delivery uh, and uh, uh, you're, it's a question. It's it's a question that we've we've thought about. I mean, uh, I think I think one of the uh, you know the the kind of first level implication here has to do with uh, the ability to uh, first of all tie uh, tie uh, equipment together in the healthcare delivery process. So if you're in the hospital, uh, this allows you to get a much higher visibility on a lot of data and and a lot of the way the various equipment and and, and machinery is being used. Um, that that's kind of first order, but but then there's the opportunity to remotely monitor people. So we now have pacemakers that you don't have to come in for a checkup. You can just the doctor can see or the nurse can see how you're you're doing, uh, and and that that applies to many other medical devices and implants. Uh, we have the ability to remotely monitor people's uh, you know, blood pressure and various other uh, values that give us a sense for how they're doing in terms of their adherence to care uh, and uh, whether uh, uh, they are, you know, moving in the right direction. And, uh, and, and so I think the first, the first wave here is going to be kind of tying together, uh, you know, kind of devices and, and products within the healthcare delivery process and then, and then taking advantage of capability. Uh, to gather information, and, and also uh, the ability uh, to actually have service deliverers con you know, kind of directed, connected live, if you will, to patients. So you, you can do virtual visits, and the virtual visit is getting better and better and better. Uh, now, in order to allow that to happen, though, the regulatory regime and things like that need to adapt. For example, in our country, the reason we don't do a lot of remote visits is, it, in many cases, the doctor doesn't get paid for it. Because you, know, you have to come in to the office to get paid. That's the rule. That's a silly rule, but that's an archaic rule. And so you've got to make sure that your incentive systems and your payment systems, uh, and even the incentive for your patients uh, and your citizens, is to actually embrace the opportunities for efficiency and effectiveness that this provides, rather than sort of hold them back. So um, I, uh, but. You have, uh, you have thoughts as well, and, and uh, I enjoyed hearing part of your presentation. So, uh, but this is an area that, that, that Indian healthcare ought to be a leader in because I think you're, you're already more pragmatic and you're already finding ways to do things much cheaper, and we're still spending vast amounts of money, much of which is wasted. So you guys should be able to teach us how to do this. We'd love to collaborate, and I will write to you, Professor Porter. <laughs> Wonderful hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Porter. We'll just jump into... Uh, the price ceremony now, because we're running short of time. I'm so sorry. Once we do that, then we'll probably, if have, we have time, we'll open it up for questions again. So, Rahul, please. First, uh, first uh, I, would I, would, I would now invite Mr. Jindal, Dr. Wilfred Olba, and Mr. Palli on stage for the unveiling of the Institute of Competitiveness's paper on Internet of Things, inspired by Professor Porter's work. Doc Dr. Olba, Mr. Jindal, and Mr. Nagendra Palli. So before I forget, I need to thank Nagi Pale for really supporting this work, who is an inspiration and a support for really getting this out. I believe you're going to really love this uh, piece of uh, paper that we have written on Internet of Things, truly inspired by Professor Porter's work.